Okay, uh, I think we should be slowly starting because by the time I make all the, you know, um, housekeeping arrangements, etc., uh, other people will will join us. So uh, just for the people that uh, have not met me before, uh, my name is Mia Mikic. I'm uh, currently advisor at large for uh, Artnet uh, and also a very, uh, a, you know, passionately leading Artnet, Artnet in, in, in a woman in Artnet, sorry. Um, uh, uh, my task today is really to moderate uh, this Artnet webinar. Uh, and uh, before we start, uh, just uh, housekeeping announcements. We are recording this session. It will be uh, posted on the website uh, of Artnet for the event uh, uh, and together with the uh, presentation and other materials that are already posted uh, with thanks to the to the speakers that uh, facilitated preparation of of those uh, materials uh, we will be uh, asking everyone to be muted and uh, off camera unless uh, they want to ask a question in the question and answer time after the after the presentation they can do it through either raising the hand and then uh, asking it in person or putting the question in the chat box and I will be trying to monitor those and uh, ask from, from there. So uh, I think that takes care of, uh, of all the announcements and uh, today's uh, topic uh, uh, has a long title because the material and the content is actually uh, very um, complex. So the intention is to talk about how to deal with trade uh, services trade costs and the vehicle to use that of course is to see what can be done through the WTO joint initiative on services domestic uh, regulation. Now services uh, have gone off the radar for some time. They came back through the pandemic in a very special way through literally looking at uh, the final consumption services like uh, in hospitality industry tra travel etc but our topic is more uh, towards those uh, intermediate uh, type of services that really play a very significant role for development uh, because they contribute to efficiency and um, uh, therefore, uh, we are really looking forward to be hearing from our expert speakers uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from, um, for their perspectives. Now, the two speakers we have today, I, I have known them for many years, and so I, I think um, they don't require special introduction, but I wouldn't be doing my, um, my duty properly if I don't uh, at least mention a few of the uh, of, of the attributes that are uh, linked and, and uh, uh, roles that they have done in, um, in, in, and they are doing in, uh, in their career. So Jane uh, Drake Brockman, uh, she is currently industry professor at the Institute for International Trade, University of Adelaide. But we of course know Jane as a world renowned expert on services competitiveness and trade in services. Uh, she has, um, she is a convener of Asia Pacific Services Coalition, uh, founder of the Australian Services Roundtable and served ex at, uh, on the executive committee of the Hong Kong Coalition of uh, Services Industries. Uh, and uh, since uh, this year, she's also uh, the co-chair of the Think 20 the task force on trade investment and growth but we know jane also through you know her really passionate work on uh, uh, everything related to services and we are really thankful for her lead role uh, in in this field marcus uh, gelito is a counselor uh, with the trade in services trade in services and investment division in the world trade organization uh, and he has uh, many years of experience uh, in the field of services as uh, as a legal advisor and and also as an expert when it comes to negotiation 
uh, on guts and uh, other areas in services. He also worked um, in the uh, in in the uh, as a, as a senior trade and services advisor in the Southern African Development Community. Uh, and of course, uh, Marcus uh, is currently uh, very much involved, uh, not only in the working party on domestic regulation, but uh, also in this joint initiative on services domestic regulation. So um, with this, uh, I think uh, I should stop talking and give the floor to our uh, experts uh, to run us uh, through, the, uh, through the prepared presentation. And we will, uh, we will then, after the presentation is finished, we'll uh, uh, move to question and discussions uh, part. Thank you so much. So, Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, am I muted still? No. 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 Okay. Marcus, if you could just move to the next slide for me and, and sit on it for a minute. My, my task in opening this presentation is just to very briefly diagnose what is the problem, why is it important for regional trade? And I want to remind uh, everybody that services value add is now over 50% of total world trade in goods and services. We know that services have been on a stronger underlying uh, long run growth trend than trade in goods for some time. And we also know from uh, research at the WTO, which was highlighted in their 2019 World Trade Report, that trade costs, the costs of doing business, international business in services, are twice as high as the costs of trade in goods, twice as high. That is a problem. We also know that a very large part of those costs come from regulatory divergence, and we've heard a lot of talk over recent years, increasing talk around the need and services for regulatory cooperation. But we also know that a very big chunk of those trade costs relate simply to the fact that there, there are very complex, unnecessarily complex regulatory procedures in many countries and also um, very opaque regulations. So the problem, the real problem is how do we how do we cut trade costs by dealing with that regulatory complexity out there. So the, the next slide, thanks um, Marcus. From a business point of view and Mia has mentioned my role in a, a number of services coalitions. In a nutshell, good trade policy always starts at home. For any business this agenda, this domestic regulation agenda is what, is what most companies see as the cutting through the red tape agenda. It's about getting your own regulatory house in order. If, if domestic regulatory regimes are inefficient, local business compliance costs are high, local business isn't competitive, it's hard to attract investment partners, it's hard to find a niche in an offshore B2B global value chain. If domestic regimes are efficient, then yes, foreign firms will be more likely to invest in and enter the local market. But there is a very strong evidence base that this kind of trade reform is win-win all around and chiefly leads to a rise in the level of domestic production of services. And there is a very well-developed empirical literature uh, that, that has time and again demonstrated that starting with work of Philippa D in Australia and then work at Sciences Po in, in France. Now, what happens when, when the level of domestic production rises, this means local services businesses are growing. So what we're really seeing here is a, a productivity gain from having removed inefficiencies in those regulatory regimes. Local SMEs and micro SMEs are the ones that experience the deepest regulatory compliance cost reductions. And this is ultimately why 
So many services business associations around the world share very similar perspectives on this particular topic. It's why the Global Services Coalition exists. It's why in Asia Pacific, our Asia Pacific Services Coalition was able to come together because SMEs everywhere. And remember the services sector really is the SME sector. They're all in the same boat and cutting trade costs for services is a complete win-win for business everywhere. We can move to the PEC survey. Marcus, on the next slide, this takes us back some years, but the business, it, it wasn't just a business survey, it was a survey of stakeholders, which was done for the um, Pacific Economic Cooperation State of the Union report in 2016. And you can see there that 62% of respondents signaled that the most serious impediment to services trade in the Asia Pacific region was transparency, multiple layers of authority and predictability of regulations. And the next slide, uh, please Marcus, simply shows that it doesn't really matter how you break, break this down in terms of respondents. The SMEs put it number one, the government people surveyed put it number one. The business associations put it number one. Big business put it number one. Services firms put it number one. And non-services firms all put it at number one. So um, on, on the next slide, um, we having established what the problem is and what we're trying to do, how have governments responded to this challenge? And I'm going to quickly mention some uh, regional and bilateral approaches, and then Marcus will come in uh, on the WTO. But if we go back to all the way back to uh, 1994, when the Uruguay round ended, and we had for the first time, we had the creation uh, of the GAPS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, and we had a built in agenda so that some negotiations would continue, including specifically on domestic regulation of services. Those negotiations started early in 2000 and in late 2001, they were incorporated into the Doha development agenda. And in Geneva, we saw literally no progress, none on services domestic regulation until in 2017, at the WTO Ministerial Council in Buenos Aires, 59 WTO members said they were going to move ahead with advancing negotiations in this area, a breakthrough. So in the next slide, I wanted to show meanwhile, what's been going on in the region, what was actually going on in Asia Pacific during this time. So we go back, very soon after the Uruguay round ends, we see the OECD principles on regulatory reform. 1999, we see APEC principles to enhance competition and regulatory reform. We're not seeing the word services yet, but we're seeing a very strong push around principles for domestic regulation. By 2001, the APEC principles were were called on trade facilitation. But if you look at some of the ones I've set out there, you'll see they're early fledgling versions of, of what we're talking about today. By 2001, we also had the APEC menu of options for voluntary liberalization, facilitation and promotion of ecotech in the word services, services trade, and investment. And there was a very big um, push by stakeholders, particularly the PECC reps around the region at that time, to get very involved. And in 2002, APEC introduced principles on transparency. They came to be called general transparency standards. And that's because the, that's because the following year, we saw those transparency principles applied specifically to services and to some other areas, including regulatory cooperation. And Mia, you're sitting there in Bangkok. 2003 was the year when Thailand 
uh, was chairing APEC, and it was a very major outcome. Uh, the Group on Services achieved APEC's first ever principles for services trade liberalization. Now, then there was a long gap, a very long gap in which nothing happened. You can see there, this slide shows 2001, we have this great outcome in Bangkok, and then silence until something happens in Buenos Aires in 2018, and then something happens in 2018. We're talking, you know, 17 years. So if I can just duck back a slide to the previous, uh, or the next slide forward, please, Marcus. What happened during that time? is we, the, the nature of the work shifted to developing self-assessment tools for regulatory best practice. And this is partly because if you're going to, um, to engage in, in ecotech, if you're going to have a big technical cooperation program around how to reform services, you need toolkits. And again, uh, the first in the series was the 2005 OECD APEC Integrated Checklist on Regulatory Reform, an extraordinarily useful document, a self-assessment tool. And I still remember now at the time uh, when the first three questions on services were drafted into that checklist. Uh, by another cluster of years later, both the business and academic stakeholders are getting edgy. They're still saying, but where are our principles? Um, we've got to go further. And then in 2014, we had another breakthrough when the World Bank really delivered first the regulatory assessment toolkit, which is a, a practical guide for assessing regulation on services, trade and investment. And I just um, put a sentence there from the abstract because I think uh, Martin Molinevo and Sebastian Sayers did an extraordinary job pointing out how important uh, domestic regulation of services was in um, boosting or dampening vibrancy of trade and services. And, if, and, and not many months later, we had um, another remarkable toolkit, valuing services in trade, a toolkit for competitiveness diagnostics. Frankly, um, that was a game changer. In, in each of uh, these years, when the OECD or the World Bank had produced something, uh, stakeholders invited them to come to APEC meetings, to public-private dialogue. And that, that work, that 2014 work, was um, really uh, something that started to capture political imagination for the first time. We're getting that word competitiveness in there. And that year, 2015, the APEC Services Competitiveness Framework was agreed. And Marcus, if you don't mind going back to the previous slide, just so I can follow logically through this story. So you see there that um, the APEC non-binding principles in 2018 direct result from that services competitiveness framework work, remarkable achievement in a very short time. And then 2020, we see the WTO Joint Initiative deliver its first draft reference paper, which of course is a negotiating document and I haven't seen it, but I've seen the 18 December 2020 leaked version on, on bilaterals.com. Uh, so we switch um, slides very, very quickly before I hand over to Marcus. Next slide, thanks. I want to mention RCEP because I think it's um, an important part of this story. So um, the the, uh, the um, countries there that have asterisks next to them are those in the JI on services domreg. So this agreement between ASEAN and its FTA partners includes disciplines on domestic regulation. Like the APEC non-binding principles, the RCEP uh, disciplines on DOMREG look very, very like what is emerging in Geneva. This is important because this is the world's largest FTA 
to date in terms of number of economies. And the, um, the disciplines are, uh, they reflect work that has taken place elsewhere, but this is, this is too big not to notice. The next slide, um, you can see these uh, disciplines in the Pacific Alliance. You see them in Hong Kong, China, uh, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Vietnam, EU, Singapore, EU, see them in Indonesia, Australia, certainly see them in ASEAN, China, certainly see them in ASEAN, Korea, US, Ecuador. We're beginning to see a repetition. And so all of this regional experimentation is now really bearing fruit. And at this point, I'll, I'll hand over to Marcus to talk about, so what are these disciplines? What what are we actually talking about? Jane, you don't want to do the next two? No, you, wanna... no yeah. Uh, okay, so these, um, uh, thank you, Jane. So um, from uh, what, what Jane explained uh, to you before on the genesis of uh, various international instruments that deal with uh, regulatory reform, touching increasingly also on services, <clears throat> Now, this is a kind of uh, attempt to depict on, a sl on one slide the overlap of what some of these important instruments are trying to achieve with uh, the elements that are also contained in the draft text of the joint initiative on domestic regulation. So you'll see here so the, the yellow shaded part are elements that are covered in all these instruments or in some of these instruments but and also in the disciplines. And then there you see some, some elements that are not part of the disciplines for a variety of reasons. Um, so you see there's a certain important amount of overlap. Uh, and obviously the, the difference of bringing these voluntary instruments into the WTO under the roof of a binding agreement is that you give um, these regulatory reform instruments a little bit of tools in the WTO uh, multilateral treaty structure. I'll talk about the details of this a little bit more in, in a minute. And also just one, uh, one element to underscore from um, Jane's presentation. We, we did an analysis of a large number of services RTAs and you can see here in the various lines that um, between 2005 and 2010 onwards, more and more of domestic regulation disciplines and elements that are contained now in this text have been picked up at a regional level. So this is also very important. And the, the, the story here is that work in the WTO, uh, Jane said there was nothing happening between uh, 1999 and 2017, which is probably true at some level, but also hurts a little bit because I'm very much associated, my whole career is associated with working on this file in that period. But um, so there's a back and forth story. There was a lot of uh, negotiation in the early 2000s up until 2009 in the WTO, and there was a very solid draft uh, text that was unfortunately linked uh, directly by many delegations, if not most, to a successful outcome on, of services market access negotiations and to a successful outcome of the DDA. So when, for a variety of reasons, DDA negotiations stalled, the services domestic regulation file also was put on hold. But that was not necessarily because no progress was made, but simply in terms of a negotiating dynamic. So what we see from that period onwards was that countries that had uh, felt positive about domestic regulations, countries like New Zealand, Australia, some others, uh, started incorporating these disciplines into their regional agreements. And uh, now we see with the RCEP negotiations uh, uh, where we have um, uh, disciplines in RCEP that are to a significant extent equivalent with the draft text on domestic regulation. We see that there is really an international recognition of these disciplines already on the regional level. But let me move back and talk a bit about um, what these disciplines are about and how they relate to 
obligations that we already have in the WTO. So as you know, um, the GATS, the services agreement, uh, the main objective is to reduce what we call market access and national treatment barriers. So quantitative type restrictions, uh, discrimination between local and foreign service suppliers. And uh, there are there's a range of fairly rudimentary regulatory provisions in the GATS, for example, on transparency or on reasonable uh, objective and impartial administration of um, measures of general application and a few other disciplines that already are uh, the basis, uh, form the basis for um, domestic regulation disciplines uh, to be developed later. Now, uh, members at the time in uh, 1990, uh, in the 1990s, when this agreement, the GATS was negotiated, they focus very strongly on the so-called liberalization aspects of the agreement, and they packed further work on domestic regulation and regulation generally into a work program. And that is what happened at the WTO in that period between 1995 and 2017, that members were developing disciplines on domestic regulation to expand on the rudimentary rules that are contained in the GATS already. What I should also say is that as members are going forward now in this joint initiative, it is very clear that whatever they put forward in these disciplines builds on the GATS, but it does not diminish or cannot legally diminish anything that the GATS already contains. Uh, and I'll explain uh, this in a, um, in a moment. So now looking at the concrete text of the disciplines, and I believe uh, Mia shared with you uh, a one page uh, which uh, provides a snapshot of the various disciplines that uh, that are contained in the reference paper. The document is a is a negotiating document that is restricted, so unfortunately we could not make this available. But we want to give you uh, an overview of what these disciplines contain and practice. So one can group them under three pillars. One I would call transparency. And here um, we uh, will see that uh, members will be required to make available all information that is needed by business to comply with requirements and procedures for authorization to supply a service. Also, members will have to respond to inquiries by service suppliers through appropriate mechanisms. And finally, the involvement of service suppliers in the rulemaking process in, uh, will be improved with a call uh, for publication of dra draft laws and regulations and the establishment of opportunities to comment by interested parties. So this whole prior comment uh, aspect has been incorporated in the uh, uh, in these disciplines. This is something that many of you uh, know from a TBT context, of course, but it is something that does not exist in a services context so far. So this is a value add of the disciplines. The second pillar, um, one could call legal certainty and predictability. And here, um, the objective of the disciplines is to ensure minimum guarantees to be followed by the competent authorities during the licensing and authorization process. So as you can see from the screen, this includes elements such as indicative timeframes for processing of applications, uh, providing information on the status of application and the possibility also to resubmit applications if the original application has been rejected and also um, um, reasonable processing times for uh, applications and a reasonable period between the publication of laws and regulation and the moment when um, service suppliers are expected to comply with them. You know, many of these things, they're not particularly novel or uh, attractive, but uh, having them in these disciplines closes a gap that uh, currently still exists in the GATS. These are things that are not codified in the GATS yet. Finally, there is a third pillar that one could call maybe improvement of regulatory quality and facilitation of services trade. And here, um, 
we see um, elements such as encouragement to accept electronic applications and uh, authenticated copies of documents uh, requiring the independence of decision making and the impartiality of decision making by regulatory authorities when they deal with authorization applications but also transparency and reasonability of authorization fees. So these in a nutshell with some examples are the objectives and the pillars that the domestic regulation disciplines are covering. Now, um, since this is meant to become a legally binding outcome, of course, flexibilities are also needed. Um, we have not talked about the um, participation in the initiative, but uh, they are both developed and developing countries uh, in this initiative from all continents of the world, from different regulatory cultures, I could say, and from different levels of development. So uh, overall, the text horizontally contains uh, flexibilities for the implementation of these disciplines. So uh, to address this issue of differences in WTO members' regulatory capacity. So it's a very flexible text. In addition, for developing countries, there is a provision that allows them to take transitional periods for in any of the sectors uh, in which they face problems and for any of the disciplines that they find difficult to implement. The length of these transitional periods has not been determined. Um, some members have already indicated they would need seven years for uh, some of the disciplines, but this is something that is yet to be determined. Now, interestingly, um, for least developed countries, the participants of the joint initiative, they essentially took over or took on board what, what had been previously negotiated in the multilateral context, namely that least developed countries may participate in this uh, uh, initiative without taking on any obligations until the time they graduate from LDC status. So the mechanism is that six months before an LDC graduates, it would then submit a schedule with the commitments on uh, domestic regulation. And in that schedule, six months before graduation, it could set out any transitional periods that it needs. So de facto for many LDCs, if they participate, the uh, implementation, the binding implementation of these disciplines could be pushed uh, backward quite a few years. And then the uh, disciplines also contain a paragraph on technical assistance and capacity building. This is not a binding paragraph on individual members, uh, but it is uh, on mutually agreed terms and conditions, mainly addressing uh, implementation capacity. Uh, Jane, uh, I don't know, do you want to go in detail through the RCEP uh, elements now? That's the next slide that comes up here. Should I hand over to you? You have to unmute. Jane, you will have to unmute. unmute. Yeah. Sorry. Um, these slides simply uh, try to uh, show in a different form from the diagram that um, Marcus displayed with the overlapping principles in different agreements, how close and yet um, elements of dissimilarity between the RCEP text and what we've seen in that leaked version back from December of 2020. You can see that the scope of coverage is effectively the same there. You can see that um, there, are, there are slight um, differences because of the nature of the agreement. I mean, the GATS is a positive list, RCEP is going in the negative list direction. So the coverage is, is necessarily different. Uh, there are no flexibilities for LDCs or transition periods in, in, um, in RCEP. The next slide goes um, into uh, comparing some of the actual disciplines. And again, you'll see um, they're not completely identical, but they are very substantially similar in most of the key areas. And so, for example, uh, publication um, 
opportunity to comment stakeholder engagement before regulations enter into force, inquiry points, et cetera, et cetera. The next slide, similarly, um, and you can all look at these um, afterwards if you're, if you're really interested, but you, you see here that again, sometimes RCEP is silent uh, on a particular issue, but most of the time um, it's very similar. And sometimes RCEP goes further. Um, and um, it, or, or does it slightly differently that has um, ultimately a slighter deeper reach. So uh, the next two slides are simply two little case studies for you. The first one just looks at uh, acceptance of documentary copies and how the two of them do it slightly differently. And the next slide uh, shows um, how it's done differently on fees. Um, but ultimately, uh, what the meaning is is pretty similar um it can be left there marcus if people are interested they they might like but i might uh, stick with this um and continue on from here for a little bit because what we have to um ask now is well um all of this um all of this regional experimentation is is beginning to deliver something now in geneva um, what, what are the benefits going to be? Are we actually going to see trade costs come down? Are we actually going through, have we got, have we got this right? Um, are we actually going to see um, a resolution of the problem that we set out to resolve? So just a quick reminder on the next slide of how important the services sector is. I, I want to remind everybody about that because in, in cutting trade costs for services, we are talking about uh, the largest uh, part of GDP in most of our economies. This is the trade and value added data. And it, it, such data doesn't exist for every APEC economy, but you will see there the average um, share of services value add in GDP is you know, it's really approaching there. It's around the 70% mark is actually higher in the Asia Pacific region than the world average. And it's therefore very important, the impact of almost any reduction in trade cost in this sector is going to have a very significant uh, impact back home in the domestic economy. So the next slide um, is a quick um, description of the um, findings uh, by the APEC Business Advisory Council, which submitted last month its report to APEC on the midterm review of the services competitiveness roadmap. And the business community goes out of its way to make the point in this report that where there are strong interlinkages between initiatives at the APEC level and what's going on in the WTO, APEC economy should be working in concert to help build critical mass for a multilateral outcome. And the business community points out in particular that the WTO JI on services domestic regulation is very deeply connected with the APEC non-binding principles. And it warrants an APEC commitment to bring APEC weight to delivering for the 12th Ministerial Council. And I'll say it again, Marcus, uh, the first and only outcome on services since the GATS was created. Not for want of trying, but Marcus, this will be your, your grand moment because you have put your particular effort into this work and this is the work that is going to deliver the first and only outcome to date. And it is um, very um, uh, important, I think, that the business community has picked up on some preliminary results uh, put out by the OECD looking at, well, if APEC economies implemented the JI on domestic regulation um, over, say, three to five years, what kind of trade cost reduction could be delivered? And those findings have now been confirmed. They were published this week 
in a June 2021 OECD trade policy brief. So they're up there online now at that uh, link I've provided there. And the data I'm going to show is drawn from this source. And, uh, you know, I want to make the point here that we've seen a remarkable um, teamwork, I think, uh, between the WTO, the OECD, the World Bank in bringing together all the work on this that has really finally galvanized um, political interest in, in negotiating a deal. This uh, diagram shows uh, that the um, across all services sectors, the average trade cost reduction for the APEC region is estimated at 7% over three to four years. You can see there on the right hand side, uh, the actual trade cost reduction uh, is as high as 22% in commercial banking, 14% in telecommunications, Insurance is 11%. These are very, very big figures, but an average over all services sectors, everyone benefits, but an average over them all of 7%. And the, the methodology by which this uh, trade cost uh, estimation takes place, I've just listed there the um, uh, reference by Sebastian Benz. And, and Jack's in 2001. Now, it's worth actually looking behind these averages because averages don't tell you the whole story. If we drill down and we look at computer services, we can see that for eight of the 14 economies in that data set, trade costs would fall by over 11%. And for five of those economies, by over 15%. For architecture, for eight or eight economies, trade costs would fall by over 12%. And for four of the economies by over 16%, very similar for engineering, very similar for engineering, except for six of the economies, a drop of over 16%. And for telecommunications, there are two economies for which trade costs would fall by over 80% insurance services in as many as 11 of those 14 economies trade costs would fall by over 10 percent and for seven of them the drop would exceed 18 percent and in other commercial services that big cluster of fast growing services the drop in trade costs exceeds 13% in as many as 11 economies. And for nine of those economies, the cut in trade costs would exceed 29%. There is a very great deal at stake here for regional trade growth and post pandemic recovery. The next slide, thank you. And the, the um, post-pandemic recovery is very dependent uh, on what happens to SMEs and services SMEs in particular. The OECD is suggesting that the trade cost reduction for SMEs is two to three percentage points higher than it is for large companies. So it, it's more like a 9% trade cost reduction for SMEs. And of course, in those sectors where the average is greater than seven, it's going to be even greater for the SME. So if you think about telecoms with 14%, it could be around 16, 17% for SMEs. Um, the, again, I've given you the link to the document there. And the next slide um, is uh, what would happen then uh, to the STRI? What would happen from implementing the JI on services DOM reg to um, the services trade restrictiveness index in the region, or if you like to think about it the other way around, what would the extent of opening up be in, in that measure? And you can see here uh, extraordinary results for computer services, the APEC average restrictiveness would fall by 21%. For accounting, motion pictures, rail freight, logistics, insurance, commercial banking, telecoms, architecture, sound recording, engineering, computer services, 
the average opening up achievable exceeds 11%. This is the win-win. This is, this is the extent to which both domestic and foreign firms can benefit from the removal of inefficient red tape. And I hand over to Marcus here. Sorry, uh, these are the, these are very uh, interesting new research from from the OECD. Um, we 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 have in in the secretariat we have done a little bit of our own research, um, uh, much more uh, simple and basic uh, in its design than what the OECD has done. We've tried to est essentially establish. Um, correlations between uh, implementation of these disciplines with uh, economic performance indicators. So what we had done is we have looked at uh, from a set of uh, members where we uh, were confident or where, where we actually our data shows that they are implementing the disciplines. Um, uh, or they're not implementing the disciplines, uh, how, how, how this relates to economic performance. So um, we're not looking here at regulatory, good regulatory practice generally, but at the very, very specific disciplines that, uh, that we have in the, in the draft text. So, um, I mean, just to, to show uh, a few correlations that uh, seem very, very obvious, really. Uh, so uh, the first one is that economies that are already implementing more of these disciplines tend to participate more actively in services trade. And this finding con appears to confirm uh, what most of you probably believe anyway, that a more transparent and predictable uh, regulatory environment is trade enabling and that cutting red tape and uh, streamlining procedures and requirements is important for improving opportunities for services suppliers to participate in international trade. Similarly, we had a correlation on entrepreneurship showing that where more disciplines are in place, the level of entrepreneurship tends to be greater in those markets. And of course, entrepreneurship is essential for the development of markets as it promotes innovation and competition. And entrepreneurship is, of course, also particularly important for small businesses who sometimes lack the resources to navigate um, opaque and uh, cumbersome and costly requirements by themselves. We also looked at various sectors. I just show you here that there was also a positive uh, connection of implementation of the disciplines in the telecom sector with regard to telecommunications prices. So economies that implement more of these disciplines tend to have greater network expansion and lower prices in the mobile telecom sector. Um, all this uh, is a, it's a different methodology, but I think it would all support the, uh, the findings that Jane has presented to you and the statements that Jane has made before on, uh, on, on the benefits of uh, improving regulatory frameworks. What I wanted to come now to, and this is the last part of uh, what, the last chapter of what we want to address before we move to a discussion is, I wanted to explain a little bit about what's happening now at the moment in Geneva, what the WTO members are trying to do with these disciplines and what the outstanding issues are. So um, now for, for all of you who are economists, now it's get, getting a little bit kind of into the nitty gritty of the um, of how to do business in the WTO. So um, WTO uh, members participating in these initiatives, in this initiative, um, they developed this text, which we call the reference paper. This reference paper contains the discipline, the disciplines on domestic regulation. And the idea is that, uh, each and every member will use this reference paper and inscribe the reference paper into their services schedule of specific commitments. So these disciplines will not become an annex to the GATS, uh, 
this is an avenue that is not possible to pursue because not all WTO members are part of this initiative and not all WTO members want to be bound by the disciplines. And of course, in the WTO structure, an annex binds every member. So there would be no chance to get a consensus on adding again an annex to the GATS. But um, members can incorporate regulatory disciplines into their services schedules through Article 18. You'll have it here on the, on the left-hand side of the slide. Article 18 uh, allows members to negotiate commitments, including on qualification standards and licensing matters. So Article 18 provides a very clear and direct empowerment of members to negotiate such commitments, but also to inscribe them into their services schedules. And this is exactly what members are trying to do. So by doing this, uh, the disciplines would become part of the GATS for those members who have inscribed them in the disciplines, in the, sorry, in their schedules, and they would apply on an MFN basis to all members. So this means a service supplier from any WTO member that does business with one of the participants of this initiative could expect to get the treatment that is set out in these disciplines. So they're benefiting all WTO members and obligations or commitments are taken on only by those who are um, taking them on. Um, there are a few um, differences in the way the disciplines would be implemented and inscribed. Uh, I mentioned one of these differences already before. This is the possibility, you see it here in the middle, for developing countries to take transitional periods these transitional periods would be inscribed. This is just a mock schedule, uh, would be inscribed in the respective schedules of commitments for each individual member uh, uh, individually and according to their needs. There is a possibility just above the transitional periods for members to opt out of one of the draft disciplines. It's one of the disciplines that has not been agreed yet. Uh, and that is a discipline on, um, non-discrimination between men and women. Uh, that discipline would require for members that are designing or developing or implementing authorization procedures to not discriminate between uh, men and women. Uh, that has not been agreed. And in any case, members have uh, could opt out from taking on that discipline. There is another element which is not shown here, and but which is very important. There is a, a alternative uh, set of disciplines for the financial services sector. Um, this uh, set of disciplines is slightly lower in the level of ambition than uh, for uh, all other services sectors. Uh, most members or most participants in the initiative uh, endorse this proposal. Uh, and many of them have indicated that they would require uh, to schedule lower level commitments for financial services to be part of this initiative. However, there is one member that has still shown uh, difficulties with accepting this proposal. So it's something that is currently a little bit in limbo. I think uh, generally, I think there's an understanding that uh, a lower level of ambition for financial services would be in the end acceptable. The question is how uh, we arrive at that agreement, whether it will be part of the disciplines or whether we have a side agreement on this, but that's a kind of a technicality, I think, essentially. One other important point I wanted to mention is that the disciplines, because they're in the services schedule, they would apply to all the sectors that individual members have undertaken uh, uh, under the GATS. So uh, countries that have undertaken commitments in say 25 services sectors, for them, the disciplines would apply to those 25 services sectors. And if you take some recent exceeding members um, uh, from, from the Asian region like, like Laos or um, which has close to hundred commitments on services, then the disciplines would apply to them on these hundred 
commitments. However, Lao is of course a LDC, so they would not undertake any such commitments. So you see there's a big disparity really in the in the application of the disciplines and practice because of the linkage to scheduled commitments. And there is a possibility uh, to expand your sectoral coverage for these disciplines uh, unilaterally. So this is covered here at the last, um, uh, in the very right column at the very bottom, the possibility for members to ex extend, to apply the disciplines to an extended set of services sectors to kind of close the gap or close the imbalance between uh, committed sectors that we have inherited from uh, the GATS times, the, late, uh, the last GATS market access negotiations finished in 1997 on financial services and telecom. So there has been in the meantime, a lot of autonomous liberalization. So there's a lot of water, so to say, uh, that could be uh, addressed here. Um, on the participation in the uh, initiative, you see uh, here that we ha have the initiative encompasses 63 members. Those members uh, cover uh, close to three quarters of world services trade, but you see uh, that the participation is a little bit uneven. So um, there's a lot of participation from Latin America, from, uh, from Europe, uh, but uh, there is very little participation at the present from uh, Africa, relatively little from, uh, there's only one ASEAN member, for example, that participates at the moment. And there is a, on the very left, you see a large US sized hole also. So the US is currently not a participant in these uh, in this initiative uh, they're evaluating their position at the moment um, however they have participated in the discussions um, very actively throughout so the outcome as it stands now would not require any major retooling for the us to join it's a decision that they will have to take. And of course, um, everyone hopes that the US will join this. They can join this. They, uh, their regime is compatible. Indeed, one could argue that many of the uh, regulatory reform processes that the US has um, initiated or actively participated in, for example, in APEC, are encompassed in these disciplines. So they're a logical kind of progression from uh, regional um, um, initiatives. Um, obviously, um, the US participation would boost uh, the participation of world services trade. It would bring it close to close to 90% of world services trade, which then brings us into this area where everyone would probably agree that this is critical mass and no further participants would need to be, uh, would be definitely needed in order to move forward with this MFN initiative. Uh, there are a couple of um, outstanding issues. Um, maybe we can address them in the questions and answers if there's an interest. The idea of um, uh, what the initiative is doing now at the moment, there's an information exchange on how individual participants have have implemented or are implementing certain disciplines in certain sectors. Members have also exchanged draft schedules that would show how they are planning to incorporate the disciplines into their own services schedules and what kind of the variables they would want to uh, use. And of course, the initiative is very uh, hard, working very hard on uh, uh, outreach to uh, secure uh, the maximum participation of more WTO members, because the um, participants in the initiative believe that this is something that is setting a global standard for good regulatory practices and services trade. Thanks. I think I pass over to Jane for the final slide. Thank you. It's a very uh, quick point uh, that I want to make um, on the last slide. Thank you. The, it's only uh, five days ago, and I thought it was worth mentioning. Last year, about this time of year, 
APEC trade ministers issued a statement to support the movement of essential goods. And this week they issued a supplementary statement on services to support the movement of essential good. They specifically um, said that APEC economies should prioritize identifying unnecessary barriers to trade in any relevant services that may hinder expediting and facilitating the movement of essential goods. And of course, uh, this includes medicines and vaccines. And the, um, the point I really want to make is uh, this sentence in the declaration, these efforts should be supported by a strong international set of disciplines. And in this context, we note the progress made in the WTO under the Joint Statement Initiative on Domestic Regulation in Services. Essentially, the, um, the trade costs that I have described as being available from implementing the domestic regulation principles would go a very long way to facilitating precisely the services that we're talking about here, including uh, courier services, logistics, transport, telecommunications, financial services, computer services, um, all the various um, services that are critical to moving goods uh, around the world. And I think um, it's important as we um, focus on our single biggest challenge at the moment, which is uh, post-pandemic recovery, uh, that we consider the vital role of services trade in achieving um, pro-growth outcomes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. This was really a uh, tour de force. Uh, thank you very much for really updating us with uh, the process and uh, and the state of art in terms of research uh, on, on, on this topic. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes left uh, and let me start with the participants' questions because I think they are very pertinent and they relate to both what uh, you were just last saying, um, uh, meaning uh, really rationalizing the need to deal with this issue given uh, su such large cost savings and gains in efficiency. So uh, Pierre Sauvé is asking a very relevant question related to one, why, uh, why do we allow weaker disciplines on financial services that are extremely relevant uh, for these uh, savings to be had. And then related question uh, he also poses uh, with respect to the treatment of LDCs and why uh, after so much learning we have had in the past uh, in terms of um, uh, letting countries not come on board with uh, joining the uh, liberalization regulation, et cetera. Why do we, again, if I am freely interpreting this question rather than reading it, uh, why we are letting them again to sort of come late to the, to the table with respect to do necessary domestic reforms uh, that are so needed for, for development? Apologies to Pierre for a uh, uh, liberal interpretation of, of, his, of his question. Um, maybe Jane, uh, I think maybe these are more addressed to, to me uh, in terms of uh, maybe I can answer them because I'm a bit closer to the actual negotiations than you maybe. Um, well, on financial services, I think it's a, it's a good question. Uh, you know, if you talk to financial services industry people, uh, they are quite interested in these disciplines because they recognize that in a highly regulated sector like financial services, the benefits uh, would be uh, most likely the largest or from these disciplines. And I think this is also what the slides that Jane presented from the OECD for APEC at least uh, would indicate. Uh, the reason why uh, the financial services alternative disciplines, which provide an option for members to choose. They can still go with the um, normal, the horizontal disciplines, or they can pick the slightly less ambitious disciplines on financial services, uh, specific what the specific disciplines on financial services. The reason is that um, 
financial services regulators in some of the members, such as the US and Canada, um, when they were consulted on the set of disciplines, uh, they uh, wanted to have uh, certain modifications uh, to them uh, with regard to a few provisions. And, uh, you know, one important uh, carve out in this alternative set of disciplines is the application to technical standards. Um, so the financial services alternative set of disciplines does not apply to financial services technical standards. Regulators and several members don't feel comfortable with that. And, you know, there may not be an economic rationale for this, but this is a negotiating reality. So this is why this has found entry in this slightly weaker set of disciplines. They're not very different. It, uh, the, the technical standards issue is one, there's a slightly weaker fee provision. So fees have to be still transparent, but the reasonability standards for uh, authorization fees has been removed. Um, but, but this is kind of, in essence, the most, uh, the most important differences. On your question on the LDCs, why, why um, are we delaying this with the LDCs? I mean, there are several reasons. Again, in, a, um, in this initiative, um, currently no LDC has signaled that they would like to participate. And this is really perplexing because LDCs, um, by participating in this initiative, they do not have any uh, legally binding obligations uh, in the way the disciplines are set out, but they can at the same time signal positively that the content of the disciplines is something that they endorse, that they uh, want to move towards if they're not already implementing, and that they will seek technical assistance to be able upon graduation to implement them. So, so it's a bit um, perplexing uh, in the sense that many of these LDCs are um, very keenly looking at their doing business rankings. They are trying to implement domestic regulatory inform, reforms to improve their business and investment climate. So um, staying out of this initiative and not signaling that they want to do essentially similar things in the WTO sends a little bit of mixed messages. That's, uh, that's something that uh, I personally haven't fully understood why there is this uh, uh, reluctance so far to participate. Thank you. Let me let Thanks. me move on on on, on this, uh, and I think Jane can can talk about this one because, and I'm going to combine uh, Chris uh, Christopher uh, Finvis and and Pierre's uh, questions, and it's about um, you know who who is actually uh, partaking in in this joint initiative and why. And so um, uh, how do you explain a relatively robust uh, sort of participate, uh, robust statement from the EPEC uh, declaration and what is finding in the PEC studies, et cetera, and rather, uh, uh, you know, a clear absence of a large majority of uh, Asian side of the, of the EPEC countries from, from the joint initiative. And also what Chris is saying is, is that uh, basically lots of regulations is coming from the subnational, uh, subnational uh, 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 regulatory authorities, and so Jane, in your work with the national national bodies, uh, what what is what what's your take on that? Okay, thank you, Mia. Um, I I will need some support from Marcus in response to Christopher as to what exactly is happening in the negotiating text on this issue. But, but let me just confirm Christopher's general point that in um, uh, very definitely the problems are not only uh, between uh, national borders. We see a lot of disconnect in, uh, in regulatory issues between um, in internal subnational borders. We also see this problem inside single markets such as the EU. We see this uh, inside free trade agreements such as ASEAN, there is um, much work that needs to be done um, both in, in at subnational level in federations and when we get inside some of these big 
big bigger blocks that look as if they're um, handling this issue, but in fact are not. What what happens inside business associations in most economies is that when governments consult them about what are the problems they're facing, what are the barriers uh, to export performance, I would say roughly one third of the time, at least one third, what is being uh, pointed out is an issue that comes back to a regulatory um, complication of some kind, complexity, opaqueness, in um, domestic regulation, and it is very often at the subnational level, very often at the subnational level. So it is a huge domestic agenda between governments and their business stakeholders. Um, before I ask, um, well, quickly on, on uh, Pierre's point, uh, we have six months to go, Pierre. So um, rather than um, being perplexed, I think what we could do is uh, note the signals and keep noting the signals as they come over the next six months as APEC gears itself up for, con for really concerted work towards um, the uh, ministerial outcome in Geneva. So um, as you know, I'm an optimist and uh, I'm hopeful uh, that APEC's work uh, is going to deliver uh, some, uh, some critical mass. Um, uh, before I give give the give the mic to to Marcus on on the subnational issue, Mia, can I just quickly address this telecoms question? Because it, in yes, I was I was going to ask you that that one next one, but please go ahead. It well, is very it, important one. Very, yeah. it's it is an important one, and I'm not a telco expert, but but let me let me say that. You know, really, when, when we're talking about regulatory transparency, we're often talking about very simple things like whether you can register a company and whether you can obtain a license to do business. Now, you only have to mention the word telecommunications to know that there are problems in those areas. I mean, the, we licensing agreements just simply may not be available. That's generally considered a barrier to competition, but the fact is it's the regulatory system does not allow you to get a license. And many, uh, on many occasions in telecoms, governments can have the ability to, to override the regulator. If you look at um, Spectrum, for example, uh, there may be no publicly available uh, information available on Spectrum. There might not be anywhere you can go to find out how it's regulated, how it's managed, what the fees are. Uh, so it it is, um, you know, it is a highly regulated sector, but the point is that when you have a couple of big outliers uh, in the data set, you're going to get those, those higher averages, I guess but it is definitely a sector which is not everywhere uh, fully privatized and where we do not have, we do not yet have the full independence of the regulator. So I think in a nutshell that they're the things I'd like to focus on, but, but the story is the same across so many other sectors. So, you know, in insurance, why is insurance so high? Well, how long does it take? How long do you have to wait as, a, as an insurance company to find out whether you've got the license? Very few countries have uh, time limits put, put on how long you have to wait. Uh, the same thing, um, for example, with broadcasting, you might not, um, you might not have publicly available criteria that tell you um, why you do or don't get a license. And you may not be entitled to be told why you don't get a license. And there might be no uh, process of appeal. So um, these are fairly typical kinds of constraints and where they occur, they're going to take those percentage averages up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Marcus, do, do you wanna add something to the subnational? Oh yeah, um, no, I think it's a very good question. Of course, um, this situation that a lot of services are not regulated at a federal level, but at a regional or local level, 
that has been considered in these negotiations. And uh, uh, so these disciplines apply to regulation undertaken at any level because uh, that's what the GATS applies to. And these disciplines are integrated into, into the GATS itself. So um, uh, the, this consideration actually has led in some sectors to to some negotiating friction along the line already in the WPDR because yeah, there are some members, for example, India who have a very strong interest in domestic regulation. They're not part of this group, but uh, much of their interest relates to qualification requirements, qualification procedures for professionals. And the, the types of uh, things that were on the table were extremely difficult for some other members to um, get agreement on domestically because of the, um, uh, the, the structure of their, the constitutional structure of their, uh, their countries and the uh, division of uh, powers and responsibilities in their countries. So, so um, that's why in this text, we have very little specificity and very few biting, uh, real biting uh, disciplines with regard to professional services. So uh, yes, it, it, ha it is reflected uh, uh, in the overall level of ambition, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You mentioned India. There was one question, and, and I would um, ask for a very brief comment on that. And uh, does, uh, does what you were just saying, Marcus, does this reflect uh, uh, any of the rationale uh, Jane, please also come in, in terms of why India did not, uh, in the end, uh, um, join RCEP in terms of services? I would not know the answer to that, Jane. Okay, so Jane? And, and all I can answer, and there, there are probably others in the audience who, who know better, that, is, that is, has never been uh, one of the issues uh, that was explained to me. Um, okay. I don't believe it has played a significant role. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, there is one very, uh, we have uh, we have actually exhausted our time, but because there's, uh, there, are, there are a couple of questions that I think uh, we, we should ask you while we have you here. Uh, one, uh, and let me put these questions and then you can pick and choose who can, who can respond to them. One is related on the possible impact of a data localization and the related uh, regulations on services trade and, and, the, and the outcome of this. Uh, another question is really linked in, uh, in a connection between non-tariff uh, measures in, in general and these domestic regulations, because we have a, a, a segment of domestic regulation, of course, in NTNs and, and, and this particular one, and whether this uh, actually helps uh, solving the, uh, the country policy making in, in, in that context. And then there is one that is uh, by, by Pralok, uh, which I'm going to read because uh, it's, um, it relates to uh, legal inconsistency when the first column of the schedule applies to sector committed in the uh, uh, services uh, uh, schedule, I think it is, uh, but the last column applies to the more than those sectors if a country wishes to apply joint, uh, joint initiative and uh, to non-committed sectors. Also, can additional commitments apply to a sector without taking uh, uh, a, a most uh, a market uh, and non-national uh, treatment uh, commitments? So um, uh, I, I, there is another uh, question uh, on the impact uh, or the uh, views on the WTO exceeding countries uh, by Linda. Uh, if you can uh, briefly comment on all of these. Uh, I think that will exhaust all the questions uh, by the participants. And um, I think it will be fair if you just uh, briefly comment uh, on, on any of these that you find um, you can respond to. Marcus, let me come in very quickly because I think you have more to say than me. So I'll say my bit very, very fast and in the interest of teamwork, hand over to you. I just address the data localization point. Um, obviously, data localization has a huge 
restrictive impact on trade in services, but it is not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the content really of um, specific um, regulations. What we're talking about is the how of them, how they are applied, how um, readily they can be um, understood, the extent to which there's been consultation around putting them in place, the extent to which you can find out online what, what the regulation says and how you can go about complying with it. So we really are talking about regulatory practices, best regulatory practices, rather than the content of specific uh, regulations um, that do, do or don't exist. It's not a negotiation about um, a specific um, individual res restrictive barriers to trade. But I'll let um, Marcus um, add to that and, and take the other questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, let me start maybe with the one on the exceeding uh, governments. Um, um, I mean, I'm, I mean, it's a webinar, so I'm, I'll take the liberty to speculate. We, uh, my, my expectation would be that the domestic regulation disciplines would uh, become a subject of discussion between uh, those members who um, uh, will undertake them in the WTO and uh, exceeding governments that want to join the WTO. I mean, you, you can already see now th uh, that in the working party reports of uh, many accessions, in particular uh, the latest one, the uh, exceeding governments commit to a range of um, measures that they promise to take with regard to, mes to domestic regulation. I would not be surprised if uh, there would be requests to them to take on in their additional commitments the whole set of domestic regulation for any sector that they include in their schedule. I mean, I have no, um, uh, I'm saying I would not be surprised uh, from my experience, but I have no hard evidence on this. But if I was a Exceeding governments, uh, I, I would, I would um, expect this to say it that way. Um, on the legal question, yeah, I think it's a very good question on how um, architecturally you you um, deal with the incorporation of new services sectors only for domestic regulation. Because when we, if you visualize a, a services schedule, you have in the sec, you have the sector column. And then you have the columns on market access, national treatment, and additional commitments. But uh, it is possible, of course, to take specific commitments only on additional commitments without making commitments on market access and national treatment. There are there's only one example so far in an existing services schedule of that uh, because I agree with you; it may not be the most logical thing to do. Uh, but it is possible, and legally, uh, the the way uh, participants have been uh, going about this, uh, the idea would be uh, to put all the disciplines in the horizontal section of the services schedule, and then for members who want to take on or want to expand the coverage of the disciplines to other sectors, to list these other sectors in the horizontal in, in that additional commitments uh, column specifically by stating in addition to sectors subsequently listed, these disciplines will also apply to the following sectors or something similar. So that there would be clarity that for um, uh, the additional sectors, uh, there would be no market access and national treatment commitments. I hope, I hope that clarifies that question, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marcus. And uh, uh, just one last question. And uh, Jane already said she's uh, uh, an optimist, but still I've, I'm going to ask uh, on the scale of one to 10, uh, how confident you are that uh, MC12 will produce a positive or, or the outcome that we are hoping in, in this regard? <laughs> 
whoever wants to start first. Marcus? Um, they'll, they'll, they'll not take it against you. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, um, I, I think I've been around for too long to be uh, confident for uh, on anything, I think. So, so I, I think it's, uh, personally, I don't think it's, uh, uh, it's a given, you know, there's a lot of positive messaging, but um, I think there's still a few things that need to happen, particularly uh, a decision on the U.S. participation that would really unblock this. I think if the U.S. decides to join, then I would be very, very positive. Um, if they decide not to join, I'm not entirely sure how... Uh, the members would go about this. I think it's not being discussed at the moment. So um, I, I wouldn't really know um, which way members would go in that case. They, of course, you know, already now they have close to three quarters of trade covered. So if this group stays together, of course, there would be a significant outcome also without the US. But uh, I, I really don't know. It's something that's, uh, that's still in the future that, that still has been uh, not discussed. Thank you. And Jane? Please unmute. Mia, I, I am an optimist. Uh, I'm working hard for an outcome and I fully expect an outcome. Um, there is work to be done, yes. But I must say this, it's, for me, it's, this is not just a matter of having an outcome or not having an outcome. I actually think it's more important than that. I think that if we don't have an outcome, we've got a death knell. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for excellent uh, content that you have provided for this, for this session. I'm really thankful to you on the behalf of all the participants and of course, Artnet. Uh, and, uh, and ESCAP. So thank you very much. And uh, we will then uh, see you all, uh, hopefully, uh, in the next uh, webinar. Meantime, I wish you good health. Uh, please get vaccinated if you have access to it and, uh, and stay on board uh, for uh, you know, moving ahead with, uh, with, with services and other areas in the WTO towards MC12. It's very important. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for participation and in particular to Jane and, and Marcus. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jane and Mia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.